co-authors of States of Incarceration, Rebellion, Reform, and America's Punishment System. Uh, Jared Shanahan, uh, who is a professor of criminal justice at Governor State University. Um, and uh, Jandarka uh, Corti, who uh, is also a professor uh, at uh, uh, Loyola University, Chicago, uh, professor of criminology and criminal justice. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I never know uh, when co-authors come on who to, to direct this first to, but I guess, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jandarka, we'll, we'll start with you here. Y you open your book speaking about what you call the George Floyd Rebellion, uh, which I love that phrasing there because um, the demonstrations were acts of rebellion and acts of abolition, uh, as you discuss. Why was that reframing so important for you to emphasize? Thank you. That's such a good question. Um, and I think, um, you know, something that Jared and I really wanted to be um, intentional about was the fact that we are, of course, a lot of people are going to be reading this book three years later. They're reflecting on the rebellion three years after it happened. Um, and there's a lot of liberal amnesia just about what actually did happen during that summer of 2020. So we wanted to, uh, to frame it as a rebellion because that's what it was, right? It was the most spectacular form of self-activity of millions of people, um, you know, who took uh, who took part in the rebellion um, in terms of direct action, in terms of the diversity of tactics, um, and it constituted one of the largest uh, examples of collective action in recent history, um, and one which was very militant and which rejected not only police violence, but the very society that police uh, violence maintains, right? Right. Well, that militancy, that, that, that is also something that, that you both emphasize there. And that was a significant portion of demonstrators um, at, and, and people just involved in this action. But there also were a lot of well-meaning liberals involved, right? You know, coming out. So, so, Jared, uh, I'll turn to you. Do you think that that um, o was kind of overemphasized or do you think that helped or hurt the movement that the, that broadened scope? Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah. You know, early in the rebellion, um, the critic Idris Robinson emphasized that one of the ways that the state and the ruling class were going to try and defeat the rebellion was by redefining it. Um, within the bounds of liberal democratic participation. But that doesn't mean that uh, the participation of liberals was bad. Um, in fact, it was amazing. You know, the participation of millions of people from all different kinds of political backgrounds actually made it so great and made it so effective and also enabled a lot of the militancy that occurred. Um, if you read uh, the siege of the third precinct in Minneapolis, which is an excellent article. It was just published on the, in the George Floyd Uprising Anthology that's coming out or came out on PM Press. Um, it's a firsthand account by somebody who was there when they burned down the third precinct. And the author emphasizes that a diversity of tactics made this possible, including the participation of a lot of people who considered themselves nonviolent protesters. So I think as we look back on uh, 2020, it's really important to emphasize that a whole lot of people came together, perhaps for different reasons, right? And perhaps they had a different analysis, but they ended up engaging in a sustained and very serious challenge to the status quo in the United States. And, and, and that kind of militancy that you described there, um, what are the lessons that you hope the country learns from that, um, you know, taking that and and it, uh, zooming out and applying it more to incarceration in all of its different systems uh, mm -hmm. as broadly as possible? Well, I can say real quick that we saw how quickly the national narrative around policing and incarceration changed um, in a few weeks of large numbers of people out in the streets engaging in direct action and confrontational tactics. And we can compare that to the two and a half years since uh, and look at what's been accomplished during that time 
by the usual suspects um, in the nonprofit sector and liberal democratic politics. And I would say we have a pretty clear example that direct action gets the goods. Mm. Right. Uh, for sure. Um, and, Let's turn to to uh, other parts of, of your book as well, um, where you kind of dive into the history uh, of mass incarceration uh, in this country. Um, because besides the fact that we literally jail more people on this planet than in uh, any other country, what makes uh, incarceration in the United States so, uh, so unique? Uh, Jen Darka, I'll, I'll turn to you with that. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a really good question. And I think um, something that there's a lot of conversations about it. So it's it's amazing that that's also happening. And I think that's also a result of the rebellion. People are way more interested now in talking about incarceration, police violence. Um, so mass incarceration is usually the term that's uh, given to define uh, this experiment that America American institutions uh, embarked on starting in the 1970s that led to an exponential increase in the number of people who are jailed uh, and incarcerated in jails and prisons in the United States. And there's like all these charts you can look up online, but it seems that the, the, the US imprisonment rate was relatively steady up until the 1970s and 1980s. And then we see this huge jump of, you know, up to the upwards of over 200%, 300%, 400%. So mass incarceration usually refers to this and also refers to the stark racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Um, again, you know, uh, when we look at uh, African-Americans incarceration rate is oftentimes five times or six times that of whites. Latinos is about three to four times of whites. So we also see a system that's very, um, uh, disproportionately uh, racialized, right? However, something that Jared and I are really clear about, and this is, again, we're not unique. We, part of writing this book and uh, thinking about this has been in conversation with other scholars, other activists who are also saying this, is that the focus on mass incarceration alone does not take into account the ways in which um, the criminal justice system has become one of the main ways in which people experience the state today, right? Um, that it goes beyond jails and prisons. It goes to uh, the most uh, quotidian police encounter, the traffic mm. stop, right? It also expands to probation and, and parole. So it's really kind of an expansive system uh, of various just of uh, various institutions that seek to stigmatize, surveil, and punish uh, the poor in America. Right, and and I mean, it's all, the your focus as well on it. And I'll turn to Jared here uh, on on it being a system of, of class domination um, that also manifests itself in those kind of along those racially stratified lines um, is, is a really important emphasis. Um, uh, and, and you also highlight how for the working class in this country, there's kind of a unified um, shared experience for m many people where uh the, the their interactions with the state have been kind of uh a, a reserved for the carceral system um, what does that do to an entire section of the country when that is the uh the the, the dominant form of interaction i'm glad you brought up the overlapping experiences of race and class that characterize how the punishment system is lived. I think it's really important to emphasize that any um, political framework that forces you to choose between race or class um, is just a complete analytical dead end. Um, we tried our best to reconstruct how the carceral state throughout history has functioned as um, an explicit tool of class domination. And I think it's really interesting to note here that the, the prison um, and other related disciplinary technologies um, that currently dominate American life were not developed in response to unfree labor in the American South during slavery. They were developed um, as disciplinary tools for free labor um, in Western Europe in the early days of capitalism. On the flip side of that, however, the particular racial division of labor in the United States has worked and developed in tandem with the growth of mass incarceration to produce a distinctly racialized form of class domination. And so 
unfortunately, the, the reconciliation of race and class in this analysis does not fit on a bumper sticker, right? It doesn't make for a great slogan just quite yet. Um, but I think we tried our best to understand um, race as a process that's constantly being created and recreated within class society at the same time as the punishment system and other modes of class domination are developing and evolving, right? And so what this means in terms of um, possibilities for solidarity across um, the lines of race that American society is um, organized along, right, is that um, there are a whole lot of white people who actually experience um, the carceral state in an extremely negative way um, at the same time, we need to be attuned to the very particular experience of African Americans in particular, who constitute um, such a disproportionate um, number of the, the punishment system's victims. Yeah, uh, Jean de, uh, Darka, uh, sorry, uh, Jean Darka, uh, Darka, la, 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 Jean Darka, I apologize. Um, yeah, I, I got tongue tied for a sec. Can you expand on that point there about? Um, about uh, it being a system for free labor, because I feel like there's a uh, people don't fully understand that those systems very much do remain, um, that there are many prisons and jails in this country that still uh, essentially exploit their prison population even further for uh for their labor uh it, it and and i think that that's a, a, gr a great example of how intrinsically tied this is to to capitalism yeah so thank you i really appreciate uh you asking that um and i think so i want to say a couple of things and we actually we take a lot of time in the book to give uh, a very accessible account of how can we think about crime and punishment uh, race and class in relationship to capitalism. And, uh, you know, and again, it's building on the work of a lot of scholars and activists, but we really want it to be in an accessible way, in a way to offer also fo folks that have been politicized by the last decade of struggles, um, continuous political language by which to talk about this, right? So I think um, it's a mistake in many ways to see mass incarceration while it's intention well intentioned, right? To see it as like, you know, after the 70s, man, like it just, everything just went wrong. But actually the history of punishment, um, you know, historically has been really important for capitalism, right? Uh, so we take some time to talk about how um, uh, crime, right? Um, you know, I mean, even like Marx and Engels talked about this, right? W uh, was an important way to to form, uh, punishment was um, kind of a reaction to crime, but it was a way to force work people to accept really crappy jobs, right? Because the alternative was a jail and a prison cell, right? So it's no coincidence that even today we see uh, the criminalization of everyday life from let's say loitering to homelessness to any kind of uh, non-wage work, right? Uh, so criminalization um, and punishment have a long history um, in its uses by capitalism, right? Uh, by the state, um, you know, the ways in which, for instance, a lot of times the, the uh, liberal democracies give this illusion that the law is uh, transparent, is equal, right? Uh, that the police are there to protect people. So I think we really need to kind of be critical of that and denaturalize a lot of those categories. Uh, but I think kind of to bring it back to the current moment, um, it's historical, right? So it's not just about this present moment, but there's a way in which I think if you watch documentaries like 13th, which I really love, right? It's a great introduction to this topic. Um, you get away feeling like there's private prisons in the United States, right? That the problem is private corporations and the problem is that prisoners are being used for their labor, right? Uh, and they're not being paid for it. So the reality is that only 12% of American prisons are privatized. Uh, most people who sit in jails and prisons across America are not much doing much work. They're sitting there. They're literally being warehoused in some ways. They're, they're being quarantined, right, from the mm. rest of society. So I think we need to have more nuanced understandings of how it is that criminalization and punishment work. Um, the last thing I'll say, especially in an era where so many people after the 70s have been thrown out of the la labor market, right? Where the kind of jobs that people had in the past no longer exist, right? Um, 
and mass incarceration, in many ways we argue, as others have, is really a response to this crisis of capitalism, this crisis of work, uh, this crisis of uh, deindustrialization, right? Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a really necessary reframing there, because um, it, there, there is sometimes like this liberal tendency to uh, tweak exploitative systems as a way to make them like, say, smarter or smart policing. Right. Which is actually what we we just saw. Um, that scorpion unit was a, a highly targeted crime unit. And um, there there are a, a bunch of different impulses that just dance around necessary, more radical uh, uh, changes there. Um, and the focus, honestly, on private prisons, as opposed to the system of imprisonment, is, is one of those. Um, wh uh, where do you think that that uh, comes from, that over-focus? Is it uh, the nonprofit industrial complex that you describe in your book, um, is it just kind of this attempt to to maintain our, our current punishment system uh, and not really look hard uh, at at what the, the work that really needs to be done? Um, where do you think that that impulse really comes from, uh, uh, Jandarka? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, I. I don't know. I, I teach. I teach a documentary, and these are conversations I have with my students who are like, "America's punishment system is wrong because like prisoners are being made to work," and I'm like, "Guys, it's wrong because people are being sent to prison, <laughs> right?" Um, but I think I think the impulse is to 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 blame corporations, right? Uh, it takes away a lot of the focus from the state, right? Uh, the fact that that most people are actually locked up in jails and prisons or being by harassed by the police, and these are all state institutions, right? Of course, we could get into the role of like the nonprofits and kind of these institutions in the punishment system, but the problem is the state. And I think for Jared and I, this is a really important intervention that abolitionists make, right? That they argue that um, the system is not broken, right? Uh, you know, it's not that, you know, after the 1970s, the system just became really messed up. I mean, there's some truth to that, of course, but the system was is built and is working the way it's intended to work, right? That there are important uh, ruling class interests, right? There's important state interests in uh, criminalization, in punishment, um, and that that the that the that the that the object of uh, where we should be directing our energy to is the state. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, and I, I, I want to ask you a bit more, Jared, about your work with Rikers, um, because that that is we're here in Brooklyn. A um, few few weeks ago, we had uh, a guest on specifically to talk about uh, Rikers and the, the the work on closing it, which is the idea that it's still not closed is, is beyond me. Um, Jared, do you mind just talking a bit about how your work on that, uh, your research on that as well, fits into your overall thesis uh, ab about prison abolition? And also, you know, if you don't mind touching on um, how the death of Khalif Browder kind of influenced some of the work in that space. Sure. Well, the, the book that I think you're referring to, Captives, um, is dedicated to Khalif Browder. And... I chose to do that because he was a, a uniquely courageous person who stood up to the punishment system that was trying to use the, the violence and horror of Rikers to force him to cop a plea to something he didn't do. It's very common. Um, and he also stood up to the system of brutality and coercion that characterizes life uh, behind bars in New York City and many places where the most powerful gangs work with um, the, the most powerful gang, the, the guards, right? And their union, which organizes them. Um, and so the work that, that I've done historically on Rikers actually ties into a lot of what Jana was just talking about um, in the way that the progressive wing of the ruling class is always trying to demonize anybody but themselves. And they're always looking to moments like moments of crisis like this and trying to uh, to redeem capitalism. They're trying to uh, separate out 
the the regressive, retrograde, violent, racist, counterproductive elements of the ruling class, who they actually really hate, right? Mm. Um, from themselves, the the forward thinking social engineers, you know, who populate the the Ford Foundation and who funded the Close Rikers campaign, you know, who pump money into places like the Institute for uh, Local uh, Governance at, at CUNY, right? Um, so my my Rikers history was an attempt to basically weld the ruling class back together and to say that these institutions of punishment and coercion that we all love to hate in the present day were as much the product of progressive reforms um, as they were the the mean law and order regressive right wingers who came later. Um, in doing so, I build on the work of uh, Naomi Murakawa in particular, who's done some excellent scholarship around this, and of course Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, and in the process, I showed that um, the New York City ruling class has. Uh, been divided, right, episodically throughout its history over the question of how to maintain class domination, right? Do you do it with um, an influx of social spending, public, uh, public assistance, public employment, public housing, or do you do it with the use of police and prisons? But at the end of the day, and we see this in moments of great upheaval from below, like 2020, like 2014, like 2011, um, both both sides of the ruling class, when they're threatened um, by upsurge from below, reveal themselves to be very much part of the same project of capitalist domination, right? So as much as we like to imagine that our favorite progressive, uh, you know, politicians are our friends, right? Or they're cool, and we want them to like us. I want AOC to read my book and talk about it in Congress. Right, um, they're very much a part of that same system, right? Um, and focusing only on the evil Republicans, um, you know, who have said the latest offensive media stunt uh, comment, right, really distracts from the the totality of capitalist domination. Well, I hear that, uh, Jared Shanahan, uh, Jandarka Corti. Uh, authors of States of Incarceration, Rebellion, Reform, and America's Punishment System. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Of course.